together. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for bringing us each here, Lord. Thank you for that promise to lift us up on higher ground, Father. We thank you for the message that you have prepared for us this evening. We pray for the presenter and that your words would be in his mouth, Lord. We ask for your blessings on each person who's here and those who are watching on broadcast, and I ask that you would guide us, help our minds to be focused, and help us to receive the truth that you've prepared for us. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to welcome you all here this evening on behalf of the Health and Temperance Ministries here at Remnant Church. Um, we're happy to see all you and happy to have you all on broadcast who are joining us online. Um, and we would like to just um, let you know that this is just the first night of our health weekend. So thank you for coming to kick off the weekend with us. And we are going to be meeting again tomorrow night at the same time, 730. We'll be here all day Saturday and all day Sunday. So please plan to stay here with us and join us in this weekend. It'll be a blessing. And please invite others as well. 
Um, I'd like to uh, also um, welcome a special welcome to um, any visitors that we have here. Thank you for coming, for joining us. And um, also a special welcome to our presenter, Elder Lemon. Uh, he has been to Remnant Church before, but the first time here in our new church. We're happy to have him. Uh, Elder Lemon is a, a speaker and um, a lifestyle coach and presenter um, uh, all around the world. And we're happy to uh, be blessed with him here. He's also co-founder of PTH Ministries. And I know the Lord has in store for us a wonderful message. So we please pray for him and pray for us as we continue to minister throughout this weekend. I'd like you all to stand with me as we sing our opening song, uh, Open My Eyes That I May See. Hymn number 326. 326. standing our scripture reading for this evening is 3 John verse 2 and it reads beloved I wish above all things that thou mightest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospers may God add a blessing to the reading of our word Amen. you may be seated Let me go ahead and say good evening to everyone. I want to welcome, welcome, welcome you all to a time that we're going to have an opportunity to talk about a subject that I know is impacting pretty much all of us, one way or the other, whether we're counted amongst the afflicted or we know someone who is afflicted. It seems like there's no one that walks on this earth that has not been impacted by disease. And tonight, we have a special emphasis as we think about a particular disease that is not even epidemic, but is now being referred to as a pandemic, worldwide issue, and that is none other than diabetes. And so we're going to have an opportunity to talk a little bit about that tonight. We're going to try to cover two principles. Uh, the first one is we're going to look at health 
from a very interesting perspective. I mean, it, in case you haven't noticed, you're not in a clinic, are you? You know, you're not in a hospital. <laughs> you know, at least not in the literal sense, right? And in, you know, the, 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 the reality is, is why are you here talking about disease? You know, when you think about disease and how to avoid it or overcome it, you don't usually see people in a church. You see people go to a clinic, or they go to a hospital, or they go to some place of a medical specialty, but they don't come to a church. But nevertheless, you all came to a church. And so there, there's a reason that I believe that you are here at a church to talk about disease. And I want you to understand that what I'll be sharing with you are principles of health. I've had the privilege of being trained at some facilities that are very well recognized in our world, places like a place called Wildwood, uh, another organization called Meat Ministry. And these are just a handful of places that are all throughout our globe that has medical practitioners who have decided to tackle disease from the perspective of lifestyle. Those of us who get trained from these organizations become lifestyle coaches, lifestyle educators, and the list goes on. And uh, so the work that I've been doing for several years has been in the realm of giving lifestyle coaching or lifestyle educating, addressing disease from the perspective of lifestyle. A lot of these diseases like diabetes, hypertension, various cancers, arthritis, and the list goes on. A lot of these diseases are what we call today WDLDs. That stands for Western Debilitating Lifestyle Diseases. When you think of diabetes, that's a WDLD. It's a Western Debilitating Lifestyle Disease. When you think of hypertension, it's a WDLD, Western Debilitating Lifestyle Disease. And I say Western because it seems like we over here in the West really impact the world. You know, I've been to many, many countries, and sometimes I get excited. You know, like when I went to Africa, I got excited. You know, obviously, I'm a black man, so, you know, my roots are clearly in Africa. So I said, well, I want to go to Africa and learn a little bit about my roots. So when I got an invitation to go to Africa, I was super excited because I'm expecting to see African culture. When I went there, I went to Botswana. And when I went to Botswana, I was amazed that when I went into the mall, well, that should give you a hint right there, the mall. When I went into the mall, it said, there was a little picture, and it had toast, orange juice, and it had eggs, and it said, our national breakfast. And in my mind, I'm like, that is very much American. And so it is that you'll find that when I went to Africa, I saw America. When I went to Romania, I saw America. When I went to Germany, I saw America. When I went to the Philippines, I saw America. It was like everywhere I was going, I saw that there was a major Western influence. Lo and behold, the Western debilitating lifestyle diseases we have here are also in Africa, in Romania, in Germany, in the Philippines, and the list goes on. And so truly, Western is not even limited to location. It's a practice. It's a way of lifestyle. And so when we talk about Western debilitating lifestyle diseases, we're talking about something that's impacted the whole world, okay? And I believe that if the lifestyle is what brought the disease on, then it is a shift in the lifestyle that can, by God's grace, make the disease go away. And so that's why we want to talk about disease from a perspective that you usually don't hear it in the average clinic, hospital, or specialty setting that we like to go to to get help for our various issues. So we're going to be talking a lot about that. So you're going to find that the Bible is actually a medical book. And, and I'm, I'm really serious about that. Like, like one of the things that, that blows my mind, in all honesty, I have read books by men who do not even acknowledge God or the Bible. But it is amazing how they address diseases and when they address diseases from the perspective of lifestyle, every single thing that they're teaching that's truth is actually found in the Bible. There are people today that say if you exercise, it can actually minimize possibilities of getting various cancers by up to 44 to 50 percent. Well, by, the Bible talked about exercise way before these scientists figured it out. There are individuals today that are realizing the more whole plant-based food that a person eats, it actually helps ward off several cancers, several forms of heart disease, 
and several types of issues with diabetes, type 1 or type 2. It's amazing how the Bible introduced the whole food plant-based diet way before science figured it out. And you can literally go down the list. And so what a lot of scientists today are writing books on and making millions through their books, a lot of these things came from this book. And so a lot of times people don't understand that the Bible, I'm not saying it in some type of theoretical, cool way and trying to spiritualize it. I really mean it when I say the Bible is a medical book. It always has been. It's just that the problem is, is that we don't, we, it's kind of like a lot of people want the benefits of God. They just don't want God. You know, give me peace, but without God. Give me joy without God. Give me love without God. Everything is let me have it all without God. And, you know, God is insulted by that because he's the one that made love. He is the, he is the very essence and embodiment of love. That's what the scriptures teach. And so what I'm going to do is share things that actually come from the Bible that we see in medical science today. Yes, I will reference to medical science. That's why I have some other books up here. So I have a book here put together by two wonderful doctors, but what they did was they addressed disease from the perspective of lifestyle. This book is called Health Power, okay? I will be making reference to these books, and you'll see it. I have a book right here, Dr. Pamplona. When I was in Switzerland and I was crossing over to the, uh, uh, the border of France, and when I was in France, Dr. Pamplona lived not far from where I was at in France. And he is a medical doctor that decided, I'm going to look at food and find out all of its medicinal properties as well as the things that can make us sick. So he put together three volumes an encyclopedia of three volumes, and they're called the Encyclopedia of Foods, they're healthy recipes and education, etc. And these books actually look into the medicinal property of food, as well as the things in food that can make you sick. And so, as an example, we're going to go ahead and talk about hypertension throughout this weekend. Quick story. I was talking to a lady who had hypertension, and she said, I, I never eat salt. I said, is that right? She said, I never eat salt. And we know that the big culprit when we think of hypertension is salt, the same way we think the big culprit in diabetes is sugar. So here it is. She said, I never eat salt. And I said, so you don't eat salt? I said, so what do you, what do you replace your salt with? She said, black pepper. She says, I put black pepper and white pepper in all of my food. So what I did was I got my little medical book, and I went, I got my volume two. I opened it up to page 88. And I showed her on page 88 of volume two of this book. And I said, can you read that for me? And she read it and it said, black pepper causes hypertension. She was floored. Pepper causes hypertension? I said, yeah, like a whole lot of other spicy foods. So we started to talk about it. And you will find that once she made the switches and the changes, man, her hypertension just poof, went away. Not a problem. So you're going to find that a lot of times when we're talking about disease, the more we get into lifestyle, that's where this one comes in pretty well, and the more we get into food, that's where these come in very well, you're going to be amazed at how a lot of things that are afflicting us now, we actually have a lot of power in our hands that we can make it go away, all right? But there's going to be one more key that I need to show you, and that's why we're going to actually start our presentation off a little bit different than probably your, your typical health lectures, okay? I'm going to talk a little bit about some things straight from the Bible that I think you're probably going to say, never heard that one before. All right? Maybe you'll say that. Not guaranteed. And listen, treat me like you treat a lot of doctors, even though I'm not a doctor. Did I say I was a doctor? All right, good. Treat me like you treat a lot of doctors. You know what we do with a lot of doctors, right? We listen to what they say. Some things we say, good. Some things we say, thanks but no thanks. Isn't that right? But it's amazing, but we do listen to them, don't we? We at least give them our ear, right? That's what I'm going to ask you to do tonight. It doesn't matter your religious background, doesn't matter where you're coming from, if you're atheist, agnostic, if you are Muslim, if you're Buddhist, if you're Christian, but you're from a various type of denomination, it doesn't matter. What I'm going to do is take me just as a guy imparting some information. You just hear it out. Whatever you think is the flesh part of the watermelon, digest it. Whatever you think is a seed, spit it out. Is that easy enough? Is that all right? Can we, can we agree to do that tonight? I think we can agree to do that. Then ha no matter what, if we can agree to do that, I already know you're going to have a good night tonight. All right? Now, as I prepare to share things, again, starting from the Bible first, and you'll see why. I want to set a foundation. 
I want to kind of cut through the chase. I want to be very straight with you because one thing I've learned is time is the one commodity that once you waste it, you can't get it back. So I am not here to waste your time. I want to tell you straight the foundation that I'm coming from, and then after that, you can decide if you'll come tomorrow night and the rest of the weekend or not. My hope, of course, is that I'll see you. But I want to tell you real straight, as not just another human to human, I want to talk to you as a brother to my brother and to my sister. Is that all right? All right. I'm going to bow my head for a word of prayer. One more time, just to ask God to help my mind stay nice and clear and focused, that what I speak will be presented clear and to the point, and hopefully through the power of his spirit to touch hearts. I'm actually going to kneel to do that. You'd like, if you'd like to, you can kneel with me. If you don't, that's all right. Just bow your heads where you are. But I'm going to offer a word of prayer, all right? Lord, there's some beautiful people here tonight. And I want to thank you for everyone who took the time to come out. They did not come here to hear foolishness. They came here to learn something maybe they don't know yet could help them. And so, Father, I'm praying that you will reveal your wisdom, that you'll reveal your love. Most importantly, that you'll reveal your power even to heal or to preserve from sickness. And I pray that whatever it is that we may learn, that ultimately you'll get glory for it, for you deserve it. We don't. And so I'm asking that you'll please abide with us. I am asking you to please forgive me of my sins if there's anything that I've said, done, or entertained in my thoughts that would block me from being able to clearly hear your voice speak to my mind. I pray that you'll please forgive me and enable me that I can communicate what you want to come across to all of my brothers and my sisters, your sons and your daughters. And I thank you that you have not only heard this prayer, but I trust that you've answered it. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I'm going to start here. And there's a reason I'm starting here. Again, there is a part to the story of sickness and disease that you more than likely will never hear in a clinic, in a hospital. And unfortunately, even if you're religious, you more than likely won't hear it in most of the religious environments that we go to. Nevertheless, there's something in the Bible that helps us understand a principle. If you have a Bible, I want you to turn to Proverbs 26. In the middle of the Bible, you have the book of Psalms. It's the biggest book in the Bible. Right after the book of Psalms is Proverbs, okay? That's David's son. And Solomon, the wise man, as he's best known, he made a statement in Proverbs 26. And I want you to think about this because you're going to find, especially when we begin talking about hypertension, when I do the hypertension presentation, you're going to find that there's another word for disease in the Bible. And I want you to look at something here in Proverbs 26. It is in Proverbs, the 26th chapter, just right there in the second verse. And I want you to see what it says. What's the first word in Proverbs 26 in verse 2? It says what? As. That's the first word, right? As. In other words, in like manner. Okay? So whatever's about to happen, it's in like manner to something else. This is what it says. As the bird by wandering, as the swallow by flying, how does the verse finish? So, in like manner, the curse caused less shall not come. Very, very interesting verse. As the bird by wandering, question, is it natural for a bird to wander from place to place? Is that natural for a bird to do that? Sure it is. As the swallow by flying, is it natural for a swallow to fly? Is that natural, normal? Sure it is. So in other words, we're talking about things that are natural, normal. As the bird by wandering and as the swallow by flying, so it is just as natural that the curse cause less shall never come. What's the lesson we learned from that verse? A curse never comes without a cause. The same way that it's natural for a bird to fly, the same way that it's natural for a swallow to fly, so it is that a curse never comes without a cause. So therefore, every time that a curse shows up, what we want to do is we want to address the cause. Don't just address the symptom. Today in medicine, often the doctors are addressing the symptom, but not the cause. You understand that? This is a big problem in healthcare. 
because health care is not really health care. Health care is more disease management. You understand that? That's our health care today. It, it is inappropriately called health care, but it's more properly called disease management. Why? Because if you go to a doctor today and say, I have cancer, what caused it? The doctor may say, we don't know, but we know you have cancer. You might go to the doctor and say, okay, I have Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, or some other neurological condition. What caused this? They're going to say, we don't know, but we know that you have the disease. Therefore, we will treat the disease. And you can really go down the list. Autoimmune diseases, huge. Type 1 diabetes is considered autoimmune. Okay? Crohn's disease, IBD, irritable bowel disease, that's immune, autoimmune. Lyme's disease is considered to be autoimmune. Autoimmune simply means the body is attacking itself. Somehow the body's going through friendly fire. It's mistaking good tissue, good organs, and good cells for bad people. And your white blood cells are attacking it and trying to take it down. Again, autoimmune disease. What's the cause? We don't know. But the Bible says a curse never comes without a cause. So what happens is, is that we have to start looking at the cause. Now, again, I use the word curse. You're probably saying, what does a curse have to do with the disease? I thought the same thing until one day I was reading the Bible. In the Bible, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, if you don't mind, let's turn there. I just want to, this is a little education for us. Deuteronomy 28. The Bible actually uses a term that we normally wouldn't connect to disease, even though that's exactly what it is. In Deuteronomy 28, anyone who studies the Bible, even minutely, knows that Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter, is the chapter of blessings and curses. That's what the whole chapter is about, blessings and curses. Verses 1 to 14 are blessings, verses 15 and onward are curses. Okay? Now, if you look at Deuteronomy 28, I'm going to show you something the Bible calls a curse, but today you wouldn't call it that. Let's notice what it says. Deuteronomy 28 I want you to watch what it says right there in verse 22. In Deuteronomy 28, in verse 22, this is one of the curses, okay? It says, the Lord shall smite thee with a consumption. What do we call consumption today in medicine? TB, tuberculosis, okay? But the Bible uses the word, and it's an old-time word called consumption. Today we call that tuberculosis. But watch this, even after that, the Lord shall smite thee with a consumption and with a fever. Now today, we understand fever to be a sickness. Back in these days, the Bible actually called it a curse. You understand that? Not only that, then it says, and with an inflammation. Today, arthritis, bronchitis, laryngitis, and any other ITIS all deal with inflammation. And so what you'll find is that sometimes the Bible just uses more old language, because you know, this is old English for those who are using a King James, where today in medicine, these things are actually called diseases. Consumption today is tuberculosis, a fever is a sickness, and then of course, inflammation, arthritis, bronchitis, and the list goes on. So when the Bible says a curse never comes without a cause, we biblically can say disease never comes without a cause. You understand that? Because one of the things, notice not all, one of the things the Bible calls disease is a curse, okay? So when Solomon said, as natural as it is for a bird to wander, as natural as it is for a swallow to fly, so it is that a curse never comes. Or shall we say, a disease never comes without a cause. Are you following that so far? You follow that so far? A disease never comes without a cause. Now, what God simply wants us to understand is this. When a doctor says there's no cause for this cancer or there's no cause for this neurological disorder, there's no cause for this problem, it would be better termed there is no known cause that we have found for your disease. That would be a more honest statement. You get that? There's no known cause for the disease that we have found. 
pertaining to you. That would be an honest statement coming from traditional medicine. You get that? Now watch this. This is why today there are many people that are crying. Today there are many people that are hurting. And they're suffering with a lot of diseases. And they want to know what caused this. They don't just want to know how can I get rid of it. They want to know what caused it. And the reason why that's an intelligent point is because, again, the more that you understand what caused the problem, the better it is that when you get well, you don't do the things that caused it in the first place that can bring it back. You ever heard of people whose cancer went into remission? Their cancer goes in remission, but unfortunately, you hear people say things like, the cancer has returned. One of the reasons that happens is because we never found out what caused it. And so when it went into remission, we kept doing the same things. And the next thing you know, we got hit. And it came back. And it came back with a vengeance. And this is why I'm going to share something with you that more than likely, you have never heard this in a clinic. You have never heard this in a hospital. You've never heard this in a place where they practice various specialties for disease, and you have never heard it even as it relates to many of our religious organizations and institutions to date. I'm going to show you something that the Bible taught it from the beginning, and all it required was the careful student to see it. Tonight we're going to be a bunch of careful students. Is that all right? Let's observe some foundations. In the beginning of time, there was a piece of fruit that was eaten. And when that piece of fruit was eaten, the Bible says, this is the, again, this is the Christian position on dealing with disease. This is the biblical position on dealing with disease. I'm, I want you to see this because when you see this, it's going to broaden our understanding. And like I said, you could treat it like eating a watermelon. You could, you could call this flesh or you could call this seed. As far as I'm concerned, I consider it definitely flesh. But nevertheless, for those of us that this is unfamiliar to us, either you're going to consider it flesh or seed, but my hope is that you'll consider it flesh because it's definitely powerful, something you can digest, something you won't just spit it out. The Bible teaches in the beginning of time, there was a being by the name of Satan who took on the form of a serpent, and he began to communicate to the first two people of creation, Adam and Eve. And he began to instigate thoughts unto them that got them to agree to partake of a fruit and violate what God said. All right? That's the story of the Bible. Now, in this, there were some repercussions. There were things that happened. This is how sin was birthed amongst humanity. God made it clear, do not eat from this tree lest you die. They disregarded what God said. They ate from the tree. Death was now introduced into our world. So the reality is, is that the serpent beguiled them into something called sin. Now, I want you to watch this. There are two fruits, at least, that we see comes with sin. Two fruits that comes from it. Once sin came into the picture in our world, the Bible says two things that came with it. Number one, Romans 6, 23 the payment, that's what the word wages means. The payment for sin is what? So once sin came into the world, what came? Death. Now watch this. It's not just sin and death. What else came into existence as a result of sin in our world? Again, Numbers 12, 10, and 11. Now let me give you the backdrop because, you know, my focus is not to go verse by verse in every point on this. In Numbers chapter 12, we have several characters. Moses, Aaron, Miriam... One character that's not really present, but she's talked about, that's Moses' wife, and then God. Moses' wife was an Ethiopian. Aaron, Miriam, and Moses were Hebrews. And there was a degree of bigotry between Miriam and Aaron, Moses' brother and sister, and the fact that Moses married this Ethiopian woman. In addition to that, God was giving very special messages to Moses. Aaron and Miriam felt, listen, if God is speaking to Moses like this, why can't God speak to us like this? And so there was an issue of jealousy or envy also in the picture. They began to complain and to bicker to the point that God saw it fit to start to address them. And this is what we read in Numbers chapter 12. 
when God addressed Aaron and addressed Miriam for their bigotry and for their gossip and their heart that was backbiting towards their brother, ultimately against God. This is what God said. And the cloud departed. God came down in the cloud. But when the cloud departed, it says, and the cloud departed from off the tabernacle. And behold, Miriam became what? Leprosy. Is leprosy a real disease today? Yes, it is. You can go to certain parts of China, and you can actually see a whole, a whole leprosy community today. Okay? Very real disease. It says, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said unto Moses, Alas, my lord, I beseech thee, lay not this what upon us? Lay not this sin upon us, wherein we have done foolishly, and wherein we have sinned. Now, that gives us lesson number two. Lesson number two is that the first thing that came with sin is what? Death. But what are we learning is another thing that came as a fruit of sin disease. You understand that? So let's get some facts out of the way. Three biblical facts. Number one, sin is the foundation of disease and death. You understand that? Sin is the foundation of disease and death. This is the biblical record. This is the biblical account. Sin is the foundation of disease and death. Now watch this. Considering that, Satan is the originator of sin and therefore the originator of disease and death. You understand that? So am I right or am I wrong when I say, God made me sick? You understand that? God's desire is not to inflict people with sickness, because sometimes we blame God for these things. The Bible is presenting a fact to us that hopefully will help change our thought process on that. The Bible declares sin is the foundation of disease and death, and Satan is the originator of sin and therefore the originator of disease and death. Now watch this. Like I said, I'm setting the foundation because, remember, as natural as it is for a bird to wander, as natural as it is for a swallow to fly, as natural as it is that a curse, a disease, never comes without a cause. What we're studying is the cause of disease. Sin brings disease. And I'm not negating lifestyle practices. We're going to get into that but I want to set the foundation now so we can clearly understand it, all right? Okay, let's continue. I told you three biblical facts. Let's go ahead and continue. What is sin? Well, the Bible helps us understand it. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, for sin is lawlessness. It's breaking the law, okay? That's what the Bible calls sin, breaking the law, lawlessness. Now, in Romans 7 and verse 7, it says, I would not have known sin except by through the law, for I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said you shall not covet. So the law that says you shall not covet is the law that if we break it, the Bible calls it sin. Where is the law that says you shall not covet? Well, Exodus 20 and verse 17. It's what we call the 10th commandment. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor. The 10th commandment. So the Bible declares that the breaking of the Ten Commandments is sin. And the fruit of that is it brings forth disease and it brings forth death. Are you following that so far? Simple enough? All right. And then James gives us a startling point. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he's guilty of all. So God wants us to understand that this is a package deal. God wants us to understand that when we're looking at this thing called sin, it is the foundation of disease and death. The reason why I think it's beautiful that you came here to learn about a disease, but you're in a church. The reason why the church is most qualified is because the church not only has medical professionals, the church not only has medical missionaries, the church not only has a group of people that have been well trained in how to address disease from the perspective of lifestyle, etc., but the church understands something that the medical world still has not figured out. Sin causes disease. It, like I said, this might be new to you. You might say, I have never heard this from my medical practitioner. My PCP has never told me this. My surgeon has never told me this. You may say that. But like I said, 
This is the perspective from the Bible. And that's why God wants us to understand it, so that way we can set a good foundation if you really want to get well. Okay? Let's continue. These three verses teaches us something about the third fact, and I want you to look at the third fact. Fact number one. The Bible says in 1 John 2 and verse 1, My little children, these things write I unto you, that you sin not. Right? Then you have John 8 and verse 11. Jesus asked the woman who was caught in adultery, did anybody condemn you? She said, no man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, well, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Finally, in John 5 and verse 14, after healing a man at the pool of Bethesda, Jesus says, behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. What is it that we're learning here? Very simple. Remember the three biblical facts. Biblical fact number one, sin is the foundation of disease and death. Biblical fact number two, Satan is the originator of sin and therefore the originator of disease and death. Biblical fact number three, sin is the choice. That's what I got from all those verses. Did you get that? All those verses. These things are right. Sin not. Sin no more. Sin no more. Well, Jesus is only saying that because it's possible. So that means that we need to understand if we're really going to combat disease, it is a beautiful thing to understand it from the perspective of cause. And what is the cause of disease? Unfortunately, it is that thing called sin. Thank the Lord, sin is a choice. And this is why the more biblical facts is the following. Behold, I will bring what? Health and cure, and I will cure them and reveal unto them the abundance of peace and truth. That I is God. And so greatest news in the world is that God actually says, you want health? God says, I will provide that to you. You get that? If you want cure, God says, I will provide that to you. But then here's where it gets even sweeter. The Bible also says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities and who healeth all thy diseases. So three, we just saw God literally says, I will keep you healthy. You want health? God says, I provide that. God says, you want cure or you want healing? God says, I provide that. In other words, it's not the prerogative of a doctor to heal because a doctor cannot heal. You see, we, we want the right thing, but we go to the wrong people. We want healing. I don't know anybody that battles with diabetes, hypertension, cancer, arthritis. We don't go to our doctors. Be honest with me. Even if you're in this room and you're afflicted with disease, do you go to your doctor to be treated? Nobody goes to their doctor to be treated. When you go to your doctor, what are you expecting? What are you hoping? I want to be cured. Isn't that right? Nobody goes to a doctor intellectually saying, I want to be treated. We go to a doctor saying, I want to be cured. I want this thing to go away. Doctor, what can I do? When they say, take this pill, we're saying, well, this, how long do I have to take it? You know why you're asking that question? Because you're expecting that one day your disease is going to go away and you won't need the pill anymore. And how disappointing it is when we say, how long do I have to take it? And they say, for the rest of your life. Because what does that tell you? That indicates we can't cure your disease. We can only manage it. And that's why I told you, we live in a disease management world. We don't live in a true health care world. You understand that? This is that difference that we're trying to, this is the paradigm shift of the way we're trying to help people think, is to understand the medical system we're in today is really not about cure, and the truth of the reason is because it can't. Let's continue. There are laws of health that you're going to see us refer to over and over and over again. When you were made, when I was made, when we were created, these were the laws of health that were to govern our bodies to help us, okay? This is at least what we call the baseline. Godly trust, open air, daily exercise, sunshine, proper rest, lots of water, always temperate and nutrition. God's plan, all right? These are laws of health that you're going to see it. When we start tackling in and zooming in on the diabetes, you're going to see these are the very things that you're going to see me bring out. Now, notice what I'm showing you. All of them have a biblical foundation. What you're going to do is, what you're going to see is you're going to see the medical practitioners of the world today. They're going to tell you 
Did you know that if you exercise, it can help your blood sugar levels, your glucose levels go down by X amount of points? What I'm showing you is before they figured that out, who knew that? God did. You get that? You're going to see. I'm going to show you. Scientifically, did you know the more time you spend in getting good sunlight, it can actually help your blood glucose levels go down and get regulated? But who knew that first? God did. You see, what, I want you to see that now. That's why I'm setting the foundation now. So that way you and I can understand God has a plan. If you're willing to get on God's plan, you have a huge chance of overcoming, not managing, overcoming your disease. I've seen it done thousands of times at this state in my life. And so this is the good news that I want to present to each of us as we get ready to, you know, kind of unlock the code to diabetes. So I want you to watch this video as we kind of get into the reality of what's going on in our medical world today. And then as I come back, we're going to go ahead and we're going to see if we can unlock the code to diabetes. So my friends in the back, you ready to play the video? All right, let's take a look at this video and I'll be right back. Your system is badly broken. The present system doesn't work and it's going to take us down. We need a whole new kind of medicine. We're in the grip of a very big industry and it doesn't want to stop making money. If I spend five minutes with you and then put in one of these stents, I'd probably get paid $1,500. For me to spend 45 minutes with a patient to try to figure out what their true problem is, I'd probably get paid $15. It's a completely irrational system. We don't have a healthcare system in this country. We have a disease management system. We're spending almost twice as much in America as any other country on Earth, but our lifespan isn't even in the top 20. 30,000 Medicare recipients die each year from care they didn't need. That's the equivalent of a jumbo jet crashing every single week. If the aviation industry killed as many people, we'd be up in arms. The administration pays you based on how many patients you see. All right, who's next? If you try and buck the system, someone says, what can we do to get your productivity up? I'm not interested in getting my productivity up. I'm interested in helping patients. We're seeing the military just being a microcosm of the problem society's having. Soldiers' use of prescription drugs has tripled in the past five years. This medications I was on. Only by accepting that the American healthcare system is badly broken will we be able to seek out the escape fires, the potential solutions. There are answers. One company has figured out how to lower healthcare costs by more than 40%. We provide incentives for people to engage in healthier behaviors. The Army Surgeon General directed that we establish the Pain Management Task Force to take a look at alternatives to narcotics. I was skeptical, so skeptical. I've gotten a lot of inspiration, a different perspective there's a different way of doing things that is possible. If I think about what healthcare could be like, it would have a lot more care in it. The healthcare system is unsustainable. We're really mortgaging the future. It's not just the health of healthcare, we're talking about the health of the nation. Now, I would highly recommend that as fast as you're able to, that you get on YouTube or wherever you can get access to it, Netflix or something like that, take a look at that program called Escape Fire. That is a very powerful documentary. And it, all it does is it, it just goes into the reality of where we are in our healthcare system today. And it gives you such a brutal reality that hopefully it'll awaken us to say, we need to do something different. And this is why, again, so as you can see, these are not just my words. You have a lot of people that are bona fide professionals, surgeons and medical doctors, and the list goes on, and they're all saying, we have a problem. You know, people are seeing it. So this is why you're here. We're going to take a look at disease. And again, I just want you to remember that foundation, because if you really want to overcome the diabetes, and if you really want to overcome the hypertension, if you want to overcome the various cancers, and the list goes on, we got to get to a place that we understand a curse never comes without a cause. And we need to understand that cause. Once we can understand the root problem, then if we can cooperate, we will see blessings beyond our expectations. And that's at least what we want to offer to everybody, okay? All right, let's continue. When we deal with diabetes, we're going to talk about unlocking the code.
okay? How do we really deal with this thing once and for all and try to understand it? So what we're going to do, if, the, if there's anybody here that doesn't fully understand what diabetes is, we're going to go ahead and show you a very super brief clip once again. And this brief clip is going to help us understand exactly what diabetes is so that way we can understand it. Forgive me for that. All right, let's go ahead and get the volume up. Type 2 diabetes occurs when your pancreas does not produce enough insulin and your body is resistant to the insulin that is produced. Insulin is a hormone that helps your body use blood sugar, known as glucose, for energy. Your body takes the food you eat and breaks down fat, protein, and carbohydrates for energy. During the digestion process, the carbohydrates from your food are broken down into glucose. Glucose is absorbed into the bloodstream where it is carried to cells throughout your body. A healthy pancreas releases a regular supply of insulin into your bloodstream. After you eat, your blood glucose levels rise and your pancreas responds by releasing more insulin to move the glucose into your cells. Insulin acts as a key, opening up the cell so it can accept the glucose. In a person with type 2 diabetes, your insulin receptors are less sensitive. Though your pancreas continues to produce some insulin, it is not enough to meet your body's needs. When your body's cells are less responsive to insulin, it is more difficult for glucose to enter the cells and raise your blood glucose level. As a person with type 2 diabetes, it is important to monitor and maintain healthy blood glucose levels. Over a long period of time, high blood glucose levels can lead to serious health complications such as heart attack and stroke, blindness, kidney failure, and nerve damage. By getting daily physical activity, eating a healthy diet, and taking your prescribed medication, you will decrease your chances of developing complications from diabetes. Now again, our desire here is to address the lifestyle perspective. We are not here to tell you what's the best medications to take because you have many options to do that. And so of everything that was recommended at the close of the video, it is our goal to say let's take a look at the lifestyle and see how that can impact the situation with diabetes. As it relates to the medication, obviously that's going to be something you're going to talk with your medical practitioner. Now, as we continue to go through the subject of diabetes, are we all right there in the back with the slide? Okay, good. So if we're dealing with diabetes, again, from the perspective of Dr. Deal and Dr. Hun uh, Luddington in the book Health Power, as we talked about it, you know, what they'll find in page 52 is here's what they say. When we're talking about what is diabetes, here's the point, all right? Diabetes occurs when the body becomes unable to handle glucose, sugar, which builds up to dangerous levels in the blood. Now continuing. I want you to watch this because this is another important point as it relates to how do we measure it. So, a diagnosis of diabetes is usually made when a blood sugar test is consistently above 125 milligrams after an eight-hour fast. Your fasting blood sugar levels of 110 to 125 are known as pre-diabetes. And actually, they actually changed the numbers up a little bit. Now, it's pretty much 100 to 125. So, if your blood sugar levels is above 100, then you unfortunately are in what's called the pre-diabetic stage. Obviously, once you get past 125 or 126 and onward, if you're there, then that is full-blown diabetes, all right? So this is what you're kind of looking out for. Now, the reason why I want you to especially pay attention to this is because watch this next slide. This is very important. Who has it? There is diagnosed and undiagnosed diabetes in the U.S. Now, watch this. When we start to go through this uh, stat, 29.1 million people, or 9.3% of the people, have diabetes. Now, let's continue. Diagnosed, 21 million people. Now, watch this. Undiagnosed, 8.1 million people. 27.8% of people with diabetes are undiagnosed. So there are a lot of us right now that are manifesting symptoms that are directly connected to diabetes. We may literally have it, and we don't know it. 
And the reason why is because a lot of us are not really on top of our health. We're not taking care of ourselves like we should. We kind of know a lot. You know, and this is what you see. You see this not only in the world. You see this in the church. We know more than we practice. You know? And uh, you know, sometimes there are individuals, we gloat over our knowledge. But it's not what you know. It's what you're doing with what you know. Even the Bible says, we talked about sin earlier. The Bible says to him that knows to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. If you still can't control your appetite, but you know you should, well, no, no, it doesn't matter how much you know at that point. It's really more important. What are you doing about what you know? So what we're trying to do is get ourselves into a place that we live what we know, okay, that we live what we know, even if you know a little bit. It's amazing how both man and God can look at somebody when at least they're living up to what they know versus the one who knows a whole lot, but they're living up to 50%, 60%, 80%, or what have you. So here it is that you want to make sure that you know. What is the easiest way to do this? Again, if you know diabetes runs in your family, if you know that you have a history of this going on, then what you do is you simply get yourself one of those little tests. You get yourself one of those machines you can get from a local drugstore. You wait eight hours, as it says right here. Well, you know, as I said in the previous slide, you wait eight hours. So that's typically overnight. You know, you, you shouldn't have had, you know, you should go to bed on an empty stomach. You go to bed, sleep for about eight hours, get up in the morning, and then you test your glucose level. And if you see that those numbers are, again, 99 or lower, good job. If it's 100 to 125, okay, danger zone. 126, okay, we're here. 126 and above, we're here. We have diabetes. What are we going to do about it? Okay? So the first thing I want to recommend to, to us is if you don't know, because it's not always based on how you feel. Everybody has up days and down days. If you don't know, please get yourself checked, especially if you know it runs through your family. All right? Simple enough. Now let's continue. When we deal with diabetes, you'll notice that the video kept talking about type 2, and there's a reason for that. When we look at type 1, which is what we call insulin-dependent diabetes, and then, of course, we have type 2, non-insulin-dependent diabetes. When we're dealing with these two, the majority of what I'm discussing tonight is going to be along the lines of type 2. The reason for that is because the great grand majority of diabetics are type 2. The, the minority are the ones with type 1. And I'm not here to gloss over the minority. If there's anybody here that has type 1 diabetes, please see me after the meeting. There's a different protocol, there's a different program that individuals can go on with type 1 that can help. But largely, individuals are battling with type 2. So that's why we're going to address that tonight. Now, continuing, when we deal with type 1, just for education purposes, type 1 afflicts about 5% of diabetics. This type of diabetes usually begins in childhood and is commonly known as juvenile diabetes. Uh, it, the, these type of diabetics cannot survive without insulin, therefore they are called insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus, okay? They cannot, their pancreas produces no insulin whatsoever. That's why they have to take the insulin shots. Well, with type 2 diabetes, however, this is where we run into a problem as it relates to this. It's called adult-onset diabetes or non-insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus. This type affects over 90% of diabetics. Like you saw, when you and I eat food, goes down into the stomach, eventually those carbs get broken down into glucose. When it starts to flow through the bloodstream, that pancreas, that wonderful system that God made, it immediately begins to produce insulin, as it were, to ride along with that glucose. So when it gets to the cell, the insulin works like a key. It just tells the cell, open up, the cell opens up, and then the glucose goes in, cell shuts, life's good. That's how it works. The problem is, is when the cell does not respond. So watch this. It's called adult onset diabetes, or most type 2 diabetics have plenty of insulin. They're not like type 1. Type 1, the pancreas is producing no insulin, so that's an issue. Type 2, your pancreas is producing plenty of it. It's producing the insulin. But the issue is something is blocking. I want you to notice that. Something, this little point right here, something blocks the insulin so it cannot do its job properly. That's the issue with type 2 diabetes. We need to find out what is that something. You get that? That's what we got to find out. What is the something that is causing the cell to not respond to the insulin? So that's what we're going to go ahead and get into. 
There are some warning signs, and again, because there's so many um, diabetics that are undiagnosed, I want you to see this. If you see any of these, please take it very seriously. If you notice any of these issues going on, this is something that you want to pay attention to. Usually, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, so let it be established, you don't want to say, oh man, I'm going through weight loss, I got diabetes. Don't just jump like that. But if you find, I have frequent urination, I'm also going through weight loss, and I'm excessively thirsty. Once you have two or three witnesses, two or three symptoms that's happening in your body, that's when you can say, you know what, I need to take a closer look at this. There's probably something going on, I need to pay attention to it. You understand that? So don't just go by one. But if you see frequent urination, excessive thirst, always lacking energy, you can juggle it as you choose. But once you start to see two or three of these things happening, it would be well to at least get checked, okay? It would be good to at least get checked. Now, one of the first steps, if you do have diabetes, what is the first step that we should take? Again, as we discussed a little earlier, what is the cause? Remember, the Bible declares the curse causeless shall not come, and Job tells us what to do. Job says, the cause which I knew not I searched it out. And as you saw earlier, sin comes as a result of violating God's law. And so sin is the originator of disease. That's where we get it from. And so that's one of the things I want to start doing is looking at my life. And is it in harmony or out of harmony with God's law? That's one of the first things you want to do. And again, you have moral law, but as I showed you, you have physical laws. God gave all of us laws to govern our bodies. You can eat. But if you eat too much, you violate physical law, and your body's going to respond. Obesity is an official disease. Are you aware of that? I just want you to understand that. So that's one thing. So obviously, overeating can produce obesity. That's a disease in and of itself. And then it causes stress on joints. It causes back issues. It causes many, many issues. Visceral fat, it can cause inflammation buildup in the system. Inflammation, especially when it's chronic it can cause what's called DNA mutation. That, this is why, if you ever wondered, why is it that people say fat can cause cancer? The, the only way you can get cancer is a regular cell must go through something called a mutation. Something has to cause it to change from a regular cell. The DNA changes and it becomes something else. Well, this is where they get into the whole issue of visceral fat, especially that's why they always say, if you're going to be obese, they say, let it be built like a pear, not like an apple. The more that you're built like an apple, the more that you have that abdominal weight, you put yourself in a greater danger zone. That's what we call visceral fat. And when it's in the body long periods of time, it can cause something called inflammation that rises up in the system. It's not always inflammatory like, you know, when you squeeze it, it hurts. When you let it go, it doesn't. Sometimes you can have inflammation going on in your bloodstream and you're not even aware of it, okay? So this is why whenever I sit down with anybody, I always encourage them to do this. Please take a note on this. If you get annual checkups alongside of your CBC, your metabolic panel, your urinalysis, and all these other things, along with all those things, I highly, highly, highly recommend get something called CRP. You need to get that. If, you get, uh, if you're going to the doctor and you're getting annual checkups, I am a huge advocate of annual checkups. I believe in that firmly. But what I'm saying is, is when you go, don't just get the regular status quo stuff that they tell you to get. What you want to do is you want to add something. You should get your vitamin D checked, for sure. Get your B12 checked, for sure. But you want to get a CRP. It's called C-reactive protein, released from the liver. You, that, that is a protein that's released from the liver that is letting you know that you got inflammation going on in your system. When you get a CRP, and if it comes back at the right numbers, congratulations. You might be obese, but at least you don't have a lot of inflammatory response going in your system. All right? But if you find that your CRP levels are high, that is the precursor to neurological disorders, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and the rest, heart disease, as well as cancer. So you want to watch out for the inflammatory responses in the body, okay? Something to think about. But always remember, when I get sick, I need to find out the cause. It's all right to stop the symptom. If your glucose levels are very high, you got to do something quick to get it down. That's fine. If your nose is bleeding, you got to stop the bleeding. That's fine. But don't get satisfied. 
just because you stopped the bleeding. You want to make sure, what caused this? Why did my body end up in this condition? And from that perspective, you will find that you will not only address the disease, by God's grace, you'll get rid of it. Now, Dr. Ray D. Strand wrote a pretty powerful book, Death by Prescription. He talks a lot about, you know, unfortunately, the challenges as it relates to the world of drug medication. And I'm going to make it very clear. I am not saying no drugs under no circumstances. That is not what I'm saying. There are cases of trauma. There are cases of emergencies where it may be appropriate to take a drug medication at a certain time. But there's a lot of drug medication taking that need not be taken if we simply knew how to address the disease from the perspective of lifestyle. And so I want to make it clear I'm not one of those individuals that say no drugs under no circumstances. That's not my belief. And I don't believe the Bible teaches that either. But what I am saying is that you want to do everything possible to avoid the need to ever use those type of things. And so Dr. Strand, when he put together his book, Death by, by Prescription, he made a very powerful confession. Is there anybody in here who's either a nurse, a doctor, a medical practitioner? Is there anybody here that's like that? All right, because I, I just wanted to see if you can help me out. And you tell me if he sounds like he's on point or not. This is what he said. He said, in medical school, I had not received any significant instruction on the subject. He's talking about diet, dietetics. He says, I was not alone. Only approximately 6% of the graduating physicians in the US have any training in nutrition. He says, medical students may take elective courses on the topic, but few actually do. The education of most physicians is disease-oriented with a heavy emphasis on pharmaceuticals. We learn about drugs and why and when to use them. So this is the honest statement that he was making in his training. Now, if you've been trained as a medical practitioner, sister, have you found that also nutrition is low on the totem pole as it relates to the point of education? Was that your experience as well in your training? Say again. One nutrition class. How many years were you in school? So you were in school for eight years. How many nutrition classes? One. OK, so again, I, I like to always use people in the audience that you know, just kind of can say, yep, that, me too. So what I'm saying is, is that if nutrition is the key of how we can get well, then it doesn't make a lot of sense to go to someone, even though they carry MD behind their name. I understand. But if they have not, like what we would do well to ask our doctor is not just simply say, because you're a doctor, you must know. What you do is you say, doctor, how much have you studied on nutrition? Do you think that's a fair question to ask? Ask them that. Because often, like my mother, when my mother had cancer, um, I was with her, stage four cancer. And I was with my mom, and we went to see a doctor. And we had a program that we were going to put my mother on. And when we put my mother on that program, my mother said, well, come see my doctor, talk to him for me, and let him know. Because he really wanted to rush her to get the chemotherapy. So I was in the uh, office with the doctor. And I said, doctor, my mother would like to try a nutraceutical approach to her disease rather than a pharmaceutical. He immediately cuts me off. He says, don't waste your time with that stuff. That stuff doesn't work. But my problem is, is, wait a minute, if you only took one class on nutrition, how do you know if it works or not? You understand that? I mean, there's, there's an intelligent rejection, but then there's an unintelligent rejection. That was an unintelligent rejection because he's not intelligent on the subject. He never studied it. He only had one class. So that's the point, is that sometimes you will hear when you say, I want to take a nutraceutical approach to overcoming my diabetes or whatever it is, don't be surprised if you hear certain doctors say, that stuff doesn't work. What you do is you listen to them, you say, all right, how much have you studied it? Just ask them that. You'd be amazed. You might hear a lot of stuttering. You might hear that. But ask them. Just say, how much have you studied it? How many classes did you take on nutrition to know its effects, whether positive or negative? How much have you studied it? Doctors are not used to the patient holding them accountable. And it, the more that we learn to hold them accountable, you will find that a lot of times they're going to say, hmm, OK, this person obviously has been studying. And they're going to either shape up on their information, or they're going to probably show themselves unworthy of being your doctor, and you can fire them. But in either case, the key is, is that we have to understand the best ways to take care of the body. And if we're talking to somebody who doesn't understand it, except to be on drugs, that might merit you to go ahead and look someplace else. 
All right, let's continue. Drug medication is becoming so concerning that I want you to watch this because I'm about to show you this clip here, and this is something a lot of us, I'm sure, are familiar with. So let's go ahead. If you can get the volume up, take a look. Some popular non-aspirin painkillers saying that the drugs cause an increased risk of heart failure. The agency says it's making the change in light of some new data that just came out, and the affected brands are ones you know, Advil, Motrin, Aleve, for example. Let's bring in Dr. Marty McCary, physician and professor of public health at Johns Hopkins. So, Dr. McCary, we all know the names of those brands. What does this data really tell us? Well, it's interesting. These are some of the most popular medications in the United States. I mean, maybe up to a quarter of everybody in the country are on one of these medications. And what the FDA here is saying is that we've known about the risks to the heart. They're very small. But we, are, we now have more information that those risks are definitely there. So they are upgrading the warning that goes on these medications to say it's not just that they may cause heart problems, it's that they can cause heart problems, especially in patients that are high risk for heart can problems. Can you describe those heart problems? Because I think when we hear a, a story like this, we think, okay, so I'm going to take a few you know, Advil and suddenly I'm going to have a heart attack. It's easy, it's easy to go from point A to point B too quickly. So what kind of heart problems are we talking about here? Well, these are problems like early onset heart attack and valve problems, heart, problems with the heart function. But the real concern here is that patients that are at risk for these things happening anyway, people with a family history of heart attack or have had heart surgery in the past, it can precipitate these events sooner. And that's why the FDA is saying if you're at high risk, you're really the population that needs to say, hey, don't just take medications because we've thought they're safe. We've, we liberally prescribe these medications telling people they're safe. Right. We should think twice when people don't really need them. According to the New York Times, the study's estimated that the relative risk increased by 10 to 50 percent depending on the drugs and the dosages. So if you have any sort of heart problems in your family history, should you avoid these drugs completely? Why even take any of them? Well, these are what we call lifestyle drugs. They're not preventing disease or treating disease. They're usually just allowing you to function better, usually. So if you can get by without them, get by without them if you're high risk for heart disease. You know, you see patients all the time that say, you know, doc, I'd rather just not take any medications. I don't like taking medications. There's probably some wisdom there when you don't need them. It is, you know, you think about the reasons why, very simple reasons why you might take a painkiller, and now you hear other things about, for example, Tylenol. One wonders if there's any really safe painkillers out there, Dr. McCary. Yeah, now Tylenol is separate from this, so it's, it's considered an alternative to the drugs con concerning in this report, but it's got its own risks of liver problems right. in high doses. So yeah, there's probably no totally benign safe medication out there. Okay. Even aspirin is in this family, and that's what we use to treat heart attacks. Well, it's a good thing. Just a reminder, if you don't really need it, don't take it. If you do take it, you have to be aware of this, and maybe just a nice warm cup of tea <laughs> might help as well. <laughs> Path of least, least resistance. Dr. McCary, Gary, great to have you on as always. Thank you very much. And so it is that, again, you know, the idea is to get educated. The idea is that the more that we understand what's out there and then we understand the possible challenges with it, because it's very concerning because a lot of people take NSAIDs, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and, you know, we take this just to address pain, but now there's all these major risks that are connected with it. And this is the reason why, again, we need to start looking at alternatives. So. You know, I'm going to go ahead and go past that a little bit. You know, when we think about various causes to type 2 diabetes, again, if I were to consult, you know, the doctors who have studied it from the perspective of lifestyle, if I were to look to some of the doctors who have spoken to it in relation from the perspective of food groups, some of the things that we find that are contributing to the cause of type 2 diabetes are the following. So it can occur if any process results in the destruction or malfunction of insulin in the cells, in the rest of the body. So obviously you can have mutations that can take place, that's a different subject, but largely it is animal fat and fat on the body. When you look at diabetes, the cause largely is based on the consumption of animal fat as well as fat on the body. These are, and they're very, very much connected. Like, just because you're obese does not mean you have diabetes. I know many people who are obese, but they don't have diabetes. But it's the combo of eating the animal fat as well as having a lot of fat or excess fat on the body. These things very much are contributive of it. 
Uh, Dr. Anderson over at the University of Kentucky did a test. And what he did on his test is he simply took a whole bunch of healthy guys, fed them a high fat diet, and in about two weeks, they all became mild diabetics, high fat diet. He took another group of lean, healthy young men, and he fed them a low fat diet, but he fed them one pound of sugar every day for 11 weeks. It didn't produce one diabetic. So the culprit is largely not the sugar, it's the fat. And that's the big question mark with diabetes. Is it really the sugar? And the answer is no. It's the fat. It is the fat in the diet and the fat on the body. That's what we have to pay attention to. Now, it doesn't mean go ahead and have sugar and have at it. Sugar is a thief. Sugar is the biggest thief that we all eat every day. Sugar absolutely provides the body with no nutrients, but it requires nutrients to be metabolized, which are your B vitamins. So sugar is a thief. Every time you eat sugar, it has to take from your body just to be broken down but it gives your body nothing. So I'm not here to endorse the consumption of sugar. And when I say sugar, I'm especially dealing with a lot of refined sugars. But these are the kind of things you want to pay attention to, the fat when we're dealing with diabetes. Now, when we normally think of malnutrition, we usually think of pictures like these. You know, What we have to understand is that another image of malnutrition is not just those, but it's pictures like these. Just because somebody's big does not mean they're getting a lot of nutrition. And the purpose of eating food is to get nutrition. And so one of the things you want to do if you're battling with diabetes is you want to start getting more of a nutritious diet. So when you think about fats, there's good fats, and then, of course, there's bad fats. When we talk about fat, I'm, re I'm recommending that you move away from that which is on you know, your left and move more towards that which is on the right, more plant-based fats, okay? And even though you see a lot of liquids there, I don't recommend a lot of usage of liquid fats, you know, your olive oils and your various oils. When you think of good fats and bad fats, you know, you got things like this. So um, over here on the left side, you got your unsaturated fats, your polys, and those are the better fats. And granted, yes, you do see fatty fish there, but there's something else you'll see. Along with the fatty fish is this. A study by scientists at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in Seattle linked eating a lot of oily fish or taking potent fish oil supplements to a 43% increased risk for prostate cancer overall and a 71 increased risk of aggressive prostate cancer. So I don't recommend fish or fish oil because as you can see, you can still get your omegas, you can still get all of the benefits of your healthy fats with all the other things on the list. You got vegetable oils, flaxseed, walnuts, olives, almonds, avocados, Brazil nuts. You have a lot of options to get your good fats. So my recommendation is definitely not to indulge in the animal fat, even the fatty fish, whether it be an oil supplement or if it be the actual product itself. The Bible actually talked about this. So remember I told you how, you know, a lot of times people say things in medical science, but the Bible said it first. Way back in Leviticus chapter 3 and verse 17, it shall be a perpetual statute for your generations throughout all your dwellings that you eat neither fat nor blood. If everybody followed this simple biblical rule, we would probably see far less diabetics, let alone many other problems in our world today. This is what the Word of God always said. Don't eat the blood of the animal and don't eat the fat that comes from the animal. God said don't do it because it gives you no benefit. It gives you all the negatives. So these were the things we were called to watch out for. So I'm going to go ahead and give you some closing thoughts here. We got just a few more minutes. I'll let you go. But what else contributes to diabetes? Again, animal fats and fried foods and refined grains. This is a huge one. White rice, your white pastas, your white breads, and of course, smoking. These are things that if you got these in your diet and if you got diabetes, you definitely want to do everything you can to try to eliminate these things from your diet. The grains are made to be eaten whole, not stripped. So you're going to find that these things you want to watch out for. Now, I'm going to go past this here, and this is where we'll close on it. We're going to have some protocols that are going to be outside. If you really want to follow like a nice program and take some nice steps towards, again, addressing diabetes, hypertension or otherwise, we're going to have some protocols outside. You can take a look at them. They've been put together by an organization that I'm privileged to be a part of and work with called Meet Ministry, Missionary Education Evangelism Training. And they are going to have some of those protocols outside as it relates to 
diabetes, hypertension, cancer, and the list goes on. If you really want to get into some nice details on it, please feel free to take a look at the conclusion of our meeting. But one thing is for sure, if you're going to really combat diabetes, this is the kind of diet you want to find yourself partaking of. It's what we call a whole food plant-based diet. In this whole food plant-based diet, whole grains. Fresh fruit is allowed to be eaten by diabetics. Of course, your nuts, your legumes, and then lots and lots of vegetables. It's a whole food plant-based diet. The more the individuals began doing this, over a period of time, they saw a literal change in their glucose level. Of course, we're going to talk into exercising and these things. We're going to go into that a little bit more tomorrow evening. We're going to get into more of these laws of health, exercise, proper rest. What does our sleep have to do with our blood glucose levels? How does it affect our vasoconstriction versus vasodilation? That's hypertension, cancer, and even psychological disorders like anxiety and depression. We're going to cover a lot of these things over the weekend. My hope and prayer is that we got just a snippet. The goal is not to get all of it, but the goal is to get just a snapshot. If we're going to tackle disease, address it from its cause. And the cause we're going to find is violation of both physical as well as moral law. This is something that we're going to need to start really looking into. And again, I encourage you, take a look at those protocols. They're going to cover more of that information for you. But God's desires, as read earlier, he really does love you. And that's why he said, beloved, my desire is that you prosper, be in health, even as your soul prospers. This is what God would like for each and every one of us. And my hope and my prayer is that we are willing to cooperate with that. And if you are willing to cooperate with that, let's all stand to our feet together and let's close with a word of prayer. And I want to thank you for coming out tonight. Take a look at some of those protocols. And by God's grace, I hope and pray that if you're battling with diabetes or otherwise, hopefully you'll see something in there that will prove very, very beneficial to you. Let's go ahead and let's have a word of prayer. Our loving Father, we are truly grateful for the things that you've shared with us. We thank you for helping us to understand the very cause of disease and then how we can look to principles of lifestyle and most importantly, your law and trusting you and that by your grace, if we cooperate, the thing that has made us sick, we can bid them farewell as a result of a change that you have empowered us to do that we can get better and then share it with others. This is our prayer that we truly ask let it begin tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much. All right, we'll have our closing steps and then we'll conclude for the evening.
special available to all who find it to be applicable to you. Sometimes when you're battling with diseases, you need help. You need to know what to do, and you need kind of like a program. So one of the things that we want to offer is one-on-one -on -one consultations. If there is someone who says, and these are free, if someone says, I am battling with a problem, I don't exactly know what to do to overcome it, and I would like to go ahead and see if I can meet with someone that can help me know a program that I can go through these things point by point on how I can go from where I'm at ultimately to a point of restoration. We want to make sure that that's available to you. So I'm going to ask you to please see me at the conclusion of the meeting. And if your desire is to get a one-on-one -on -one consultation, it'll be my pleasure to go ahead and do what we can to furnish you with that to see how you can go from where you are ultimately to the ideal that God has set for you. So please keep that in mind. We want to thank you again for coming out this evening. May God bless each and every one of you. Get home safely, and we look forward to seeing you, Lord willing, tomorrow evening, 730, where once again we're going to be dealing with some of the challenges pertaining not only to diabetes, but also as it pertains to some of the depression issues, anxiety, some of the problems that we have from a psychological standpoint. How can we get to a place that we can have peace of mind? We're going to talk about that, both from science and from the Word of God. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you very much. You can consider yourselves dismissed. God bless you.